Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle. I suppose we've lots of jokes over the weekend. Clean sheet, uh, no defeat, not too bad. Unless, of course, you did actually make the journey up to Bradford. Uh, how far did you get there? Um, I got to the bottom of the M something or other. Uh, had a coffee when I saw that photo on Twitter because it was pretty obvious the game was going to be off. I think Mr Stellard managed to make it. Um one of our flock, I'm sure she will be on very soon, Anna Wiley. Um, she managed to blag uh, a photo shoot with Macaulay Langstaff sprawled across the faux leather seats of the team bus outside the ground. There you go. There's not going to be a game on. I suppose there is some consolation there. Um, on to more serious matters. Where are you with Notts County's current predicament? Wimbledon now is the next game. Bottom half of the table, six points off the playoffs. Um, Stell called it a must-win game last week. Uh, obviously, it wasn't. We'll be diving into that and getting Stell's own thoughts and opinions of exactly where we are as a club right now. Um, I've also asked, should the EFL do more to prevent postponements closer to kickoff? I think what we perhaps should point out in a marginal defence of Bradford... Uh, I think a lot of people put two and two and said, well, the previous week against Barrow, it was also called off. That, of course, was at Barrow. So they were kind of on the boot was on the other foot there. Um, but it is renowned as a very, very poor playing service. Should clubs be made to do more to keep their pitches in better condition, given they are playing at professional level? A um, few thoughts, introductory ones from our flock. Phil Davis, is it time for a complete team rebuild? Uh, this one is failing and it's not looking recoverable. Personally, says John Parnham, I think that the, the Bradford pitch wasn't fit to play on without the rain. I think the clubs should be held responsible for the standards of their playing surface. Paul Huskisson went to Bradford, got to the ground and came home. Uh, Richard Tomlinson, if the team can find that early season form, then in true not style, anything is possible. Richard, for one, not giving up on the playoffs. Evening from Dave Woolley. Um, Gary Smithurst, we'll try and answer this as best we can in a little bit. How did the ref originally deem it playable when Moses would have deemed it <laughs> uh, not so? Disgraceful pitch at any level. Uh, it was like the baseball ground circa 1974. Those of us of a certain vintage. I'm not sure whether you were born still, but it is your club. I'm sure your dad would have many memories of the baseball ground, uh, watching them uh, trying to find a blade of grass between about November and March. Uh, evening all from Graham Oates, uh, Kenneth Pointer, uh, Jürgen Halligan, evening all. Glad now I've got a refund for my ticket. Might be able to go to a rearranged game. Moto Guzzi on order. Jürgen had a bit of a crash with his Harley. Uh, it's been written off, so he's now got a Moto Guzzi. I know nothing about motorbikes, but anyway, uh, just stay on your own. Uh, stay on the wheels this time, Jürgen. Uh, Alcazar, evening all, decided not to go... Um, to any more away matches after having to stand at Mansfield for the whole of the match. Four miles short of the ground I got to, says Stephen Newton. Uh, Malcolm Shearston uh, on the supporters coach, five minutes away. Uh, evening all from Martin Shipley. Looking forward to our 12-match unbeaten run. Ever the optimist. There you go. Uh Top uh, top bins from Martin Shipley when it comes to optimism. Lippy Jane on holiday, so please it was off. All family from Nottingham are fed up. Uh, nearest game to us now. Um, Gaza Lee, blimey, was up in Montrose. Crikey for the weekend. Nearly went to Montrose 4, Alloa 3. <laughs> you should have gone. Uh, we'll now get to Bradford. Uh, Ian Cooksey, right this season off, not going up, not going down. Time to experiment and get the end of season retain list already. Right, plenty more, but we'll. Uh, I don't want Stell to feel neglected. Um, now then, uh, lots to talk about. We may not have played. Um, did you get to the stadium and did you get to see the pitch firsthand, Stell? Yes, yes, we did. Um, we got there relatively early. We were there probably parked up about quarter to one, um, you know, in and amongst all the rain, again, travelling up there. Yeah, got there about quarter to one, me and Dave, and we did get there. Now, 
I'll tell you our experience, and we we had a few different experiences while we were there. We we sort of got there quarter one. We didn't leave till about half past two. Um, but yeah, walking from the car park across the road into the ground, we we had to go through two sets of security stewards thing to get your your accreditation or whatever to get in. Both sets of stewards said to us, "Have you seen the pitch?" Now, obviously, we hadn't because we hadn't been in the ground. But that, so immediately you're thinking, "Oh God." You know, is, what is that time just was because that then, Snell? What time this was would that? have been literally about five to one? Okay, about five to one walking from the I say got there about quarter two, walking from the car park to the ground, about five to one. So you're thinking, well, is this because the rain it's flooded, or is it because it's just a poor pitch anyway? So it's, it's no tourist, it's been bad ever since I played there, but sadly, it was even worse, it was unplayable. Um, so you're thinking, right, and as you go into the stand, you go up the steps to the press box. There was already a fair few Bradford, you know, uh, officials there and and press members and and all that sort of thing, local paper, local radio, standing around. And we we went up the steps, as you do at football grounds. And as soon as you could actually see the pitch, I think within about two seconds, I said, well, there's no game on that. That, That's going to be game off. It was was never, ever going to be played. Now, we got to see the pitch at, I would say, one o'clock, maybe five past one. Right? right, and within two seconds, I'm telling you, there was never ever going to be a game on, on that pitch. Um, but what was what you did see on the pitch was a ring of the officials, the ref match referees, and and the assistants, the Bradford officials who obviously have to look after them, liaise with them, and the police were on the pitch as well. Uh, then you also had ground staff. With, I mean, God help them. They, they, they had three or four members with forks trying to fork it, um, and then they had, you know, the, the main man on the floor. They had, um, like, see at the cricket, these rollers with the soaker up yeah. things on yeah. them, and that was one of the, the funniest things. When, when they tried to do that in the worst part of the pitch, it just literally took the top two inches of mud with it. it didn't oh. roll; it just pushed the top two inches of mud. It, it was that bad. It was. People have seen the the pictures but it, it was that bad there was never ever going to be a game the bit that I couldn't get me around although there's obviously um you know they, they've got um protocols to go through and things like that before they can officially say it's off and I think they were waiting for the Notts County players and the manager to arrive which they did at probably I don't know 25 past half past one whatever it was and they went out Graham Alexander Stuart Maynard went out and within about probably 10 minutes, then the official announcement was made. But from, from us getting there, the official announcement was probably 35 minutes to say that it was off. Now, no no problem. I mean, Bradford ground staff, they were doing everything they could. They got big inflatable rollers, put sheets the full width of the pitch to try and soak it up. But it, it was, you know, it's, it's like the, the boy with his fingers in the dike, isn't it? Trying to stop a, stop a flood. Um, it was just never going to be on. So why, and and again, somebody, I don't know the protocols, but why that decision couldn't have been made earlier to save people, it wouldn't have saved loads because obviously people would have had to travel, but why why find out when people are actually at the ground? Because I, when we were leaving, I spoke to a few Knots fans as well, but people getting five miles away, at least if they're 30 miles away, 40 miles away, it saves them a bit of petrol money. Still inconvenience, of course it is, but... You know, every little helps, as they say. But it, it was it was never going to go on. Carl Cameron walked on the pitch with, you know, and I think the players were more concerned about not messing up their train as it yeah. was that bad. But he walked on the pitch and sort of looked as if, like, what on earth are we even doing here? It, it was a waste of time. So frustrating as ever. Now then, after that, and we were loitering and lingering, we did a little bit on the radio. We went pitch side because, you know, Dave had to do a little bit of a, a chat with Stuart Maynard, get a word with him. Um, so we were stood in the little uh, groundsman's hut. So we got speaking to the groundsman who assured us that at about, well, he said about lunchtime, but I would have, I would have said about probably 11, half 11, he assured us the pitch was playable. So now bear in mind, groundsmen always think their pitches are like bowling greens and hallow turf, even if there's no grass on them. You take it with a pinch of salt. After that, one of the Bradford players who was sort of in his gear, he walked past us, he said, we could have told you this would have been off yesterday. Again, he's not qualified as a groundsman. He's a player, but, you know, obviously had his doubts. And I think a lot of it comes down to how much store you put in the weather forecast. 
You know, do you call games off? It's obviously a bad pitch. And the Bradford side of things there, at radio, media people, we're actually having the conversation. Is there a worse pitch in the Football League? So I don't think I don't think I've certainly I've certainly not seen one as bad. They were right saying like Peterborough's might be a contender, but I'm not seeing that up close lately. Um, so yeah, so so we had all sort of sides of it. It was never ever going to be played from the second I went in in the ground, but they still carried on for 35, 40 minutes trying to see what they could do. But it, it was never going to be played. And I mean, it's if it had, it would have been. We, we were making a joke saying it would have been interesting to see them play on it because it would have been it would have been like it's a knockout from years ago. It would have been absolutely farcical and it would have ruined the pitch forever and a day. So, you know, as bad as it is, it was the right decision. But I just, the frustration is why it can't be made earlier. Yeah, I've tried to dive into this a little bit um, and I've made a few inquiries, you know, unofficially and officially. So I think this came as a big surprise, not only to the travelling fans, me among them, um, based on there's no plans for a pitch inspection. Yeah, it's perfectly playable. Now, Knott's, the, the, the Knott's travelling group were led to believe that as well. They they did not have any idea that this match was ever in any doubt. Um, the Often, as you would know, Stel, the players uh, travel overnight. Yeah, bed themselves down. They went up on the morning of the game. Um the first knots knew that there that the game was actually in doubt was the tweet that came out from Bradford and the picture that appeared on so the leaked picture that appeared on social media. So before then, knots were in the dark from a perspective they had not been prepared that the game might be in doubt and would be called off. Um, it would appear um, that Bradford were, inverted commas, playing their cards close to their chest. And let's be honest, you and I both know clubs will decide do they want the game playing based on their current form and based on their visitors' current form. So I think it's no... Look, you know, it's no surprise that Bradford wanted the game on, given Knotts' current run of form, I'm sure. You know, and conversely, if Bradford had lost six on the trot, Knotts had won six on the trot, you and I might cynically say that game would have been called off at nine o'clock on Saturday morning. Um, but Bradford, you know, I, I think they cajoled the referee a little bit. Um, it was interesting the statement initially Bradford put out about how the referee had virtually and physically looked at the pitch. Now, I took that as virtually looking at the pitch in being shown a Zoom call or something like that, you know, while he's in his hotel room thinking there's no issues, you know. Um, now, um, from what Bradford are saying, there was a, a biblical storm round about 12, 12, 30. Now, did you witness that biblical storm or you were you not quite at the ground at that point? Well, I was, uh, yeah, I was like a lot of people, I was travelling up, so I would have been on the M1. Now, I, right. I, I can confirm that there was there was a storm on the M1, you know, and, yeah. and I don't think that's in doubt, you know, that there was obviously a storm for that amount of water to be on the pitch. Um, but it wasn't an unforecasted storm, you know, no, but nobody there. It, and again, when you go into the realms of, do you call a game off based on a weather forecast? Because, you know, how, how accurate are they? But... Yeah, it, it was. It rained. It rained pretty hard. I mean, I, there's no no two ways about that. Obviously, for the amount of water that was on the pitch, it had obviously rained hard. Um, and and I say the groundsman swore to. Well, I say swore, but he, he said to us that the pitch was perfectly playable. Come lunchtime, now it certainly wasn't playable. At let's say five past one when I got in the ground, and and I'm no expert on things. I'm obviously not a groundsman, not qualified anything like that. But there was no way they were going to get that amount of water off the pitch in that amount of time with given the condition of the pitch anyway. Um, so it's, it's, look, it, it's, it's a frustration massively that, that that's the, you know, and we were speaking to players again, speaking to plenty of people. We even got shown that their, their, the week before their game at Barrow had been called off Bradford's yes. and they showed us pictures of the Barrow pitch. And we've obviously been up to Barrow. It was looked like a billiard table. 
except they said the reason it was off, there was one area in the goal mouth, apparently, that was deemed unplayable. And you talk about virtual, a referee virtually looking at the pitch. They were saying that the, the referee at Barrow, between Barrow and Bradford, the week previous, the referee was seen holding his phone up to show whether it was his assessor or the referees, mm. whoever it was, overseer. Uh, and Lee Mason, you remember the former, yeah. former referee, was there on Saturday. So these people are there, more experienced referees are there and present. At the Barrow game, they were saying they were holding up a phone and showing him, using the camera, basically showing them the area of the pitch and saying, look, this is what it looks like. So they obviously do do virtual, whatever you want to call that, testing of the ground and getting a second opinion. What that's worth when you're not actually there, I don't know. The 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 <laughs> the bit we were sort of taking the mickey out of, particularly on Saturday, was, like I say, we were there for 35 minutes before the game, 30 minutes, 35 minutes before the game was actually officially called off. There was one fella, don't know who he was, walking around with a ball in his hand, a football in his hand. At no point in that half hour did he let go of it, put it on the floor, try passing a ball, well, throwing it up in the air, seeing if it would bounce, whatever. It, it was like his favourite teddy bear. He wasn't going to let it go. It was almost if he says, I'm not even going to get this dirty. It's not even not even <laughs> worth it. So so we stood, I mean, it was, it was I don't want to say farcical, because that, that's making it sound over dramatic for what it was but like you got there and you're going well what is the protocol they're having to go through here to to not say one o'clock this game ain't going to go ahead we'll make the decision at, at 20 to one nothing happened in that time in fact it didn't particularly rain too much i think it was only when it started raining lightly again that, that the official decision had been made and then typically about 10 minutes after the decision had been made it absolutely larriped it down then so There'd have been no chance of the game going ahead, even if they had deemed it okay at one o'clock. So, uh, sorry, off one quarter to two. So it, it was a little bit farcical, um, but you know, I say, what do you do? Bradford's pitch is so poor. And we, again, speaking to them, they reckon, and it's historically always been poor. Um, they reckon it take it will cost them over a million pounds to to resurrect it due to the lack of sunlight from the big stands due to the what it's actually been built on the lack of drainage that's there and any sort of solution that people come up with it's going to cost them over a million pounds and obviously clubs don't want to spend over a million pound on a playing surface yeah i i think that's an interesting point you raised though because you know football's played on a football pitch in it and clubs will spend millions of pounds on the stadium but as a footballer you know what we watch is played on a on, on a piece of grass you're not allowed synthetic surfaces in the football league are you and um if you remember we were going down to newport weren't we a few weeks ago and there were all sorts of horror stories because it was tipping down wasn't it it's gonna be off it's a terrible pitch historically and we got there and the pitch was brilliant wasn't it a pitch was absolute now I'm pretty certain here that Newport were kind of put under a bit of a three-line whip because their pitch had basically been a ploughed field for I don't know how long to spend quite a bit of money because the rugby's played on it. And clearly that money, that investment on the pitch uh, paid off for when we went down there. And the pitch was absolutely perfect from what I could see. I don't know whether it was a deso because you could hardly take a divot out of it, could you? Um, you know, I do wonder... You know, if if the league cannot bring a bit more pressure to bear on clubs to say, look, this pitch is actually really unacceptable at, at, at football league level. You need to come up with a plan to show us how you are going to improve your playing surface because it's the single most important thing at a ground. It's what you play your football on, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there might well be something in place. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I've got, I've got to be honest because you know every pitch. <laughs> I'm supposed to just like in cricket, but every pitch. We'll get a grade. We'll get a marking by mm. by teams after a yeah. game. And you would think them, like you say, Newport's is a, is a great example. Although maybe again not comparable to Bradford because of the circumstances. Newport's is a wide open stadium, a wide open yeah. patch of grass, which will get natural sunlight. Which hey, look, I'm I'm no Monty Don. I don't know anything about <laughs> all the all, all this sort of stuff. How you grow grass and how you keep it and all that sort of stuff. But you know. You see the heat lamps that you know that, that not have got not the heat lamps the the, the light you, you know the um, artificial lights that go on straight after games to to you know get the grass to grow or you know encourage it to grow whatever you um, 
Newport don't have that problem. So they've obviously had investment to sort the pitch out, sort the drainage out, but it is a wide open ground that is going to get uh, plenty of sunlight. Bradford's isn't. You know, Bradford's is more enclosed probably than Knotts, you know, because they've yeah. got the, the big stadiums, big stands on two sides particularly and the corner filled in as well, which was which is where the worst bit is. It's a historically poor pitch anyway. And say the bits I've picked up and from speaking to people at the weekend, um, there are historical reasons why it's so poorly draining uh, that, like I say, are not easily overcome. So, you know, as much as we're all saying, you know, we, we all could come up with a top of a head idea of how they yeah. should improve it, what they should do. Apparently, it's not not quite as cut and dried as that. And they did, I think they did like dig it up and, and relay a pitch. I think they were saying two years ago that was supposed to have sorted it out or partially sorted out, and it hasn't, obviously. So, you know, you, you, again, you have to, in a way, trust that you're right, that you have to trust the people that know what they're doing about pitches and, and leave it in their hands. But also, you've got to trust that the authorities, i.e. the Football League, are in contact with clubs, be it Peterborough, be it Bradford, and saying to them, look, your pitch is not good enough. Like you say, not good enough. And we are not going to take the retrograde step of allowing artificial pitches, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, make it an unfair advantage pretty much for the home team. So, you know, if you keep getting marked low, just as in the cricket, you know, they, they mark a wicket, yeah, don't they? And you yeah. get points deducted. Yeah. Then, you know, there might be some, I'll be honest, but I, there might be something like that in football. Eventually, I know nobody's ever suffered it, but there might be some sort of punishment in football you know, that I'm assuming it would be financial, you know, eventually if, if a pitch yeah. was so bad for so many years. But it but it is like I say, I don't know I don't know the solution. I, I'm not I'm not a, a landscape gardener, I'm not a groundsman and I and I don't know what the solution is. But they're just they're just that's just some of the feedback we got from asking we like I say we were there for probably an hour and a half on Saturday and speaking to the people at Bradford, including their groundsmen um and staff. It's it's not a simple solution, let's put it that way. Well, not a simple solution that money, you know, doesn't solve, if you like it, outside of having a million pounds, they reckon that, that it's not an easy solution. Ian G says, fines or a forfeit of games would be a decent deterrent if games called off uh, at the last minute. Um, da -da -da. Magpie says, it be nice to hear again from Joe Palmer giving an update on things happening at the club. The club did announce, uh, Stan and I both saw it today, um, a new kind of memory club initiative, encouraging former old players to come together. Um, I've not had a chance to digest it all yet, but it looks a, it looks a very good initiative. Uh, in terms of integrating and getting former players actively involved uh, at the club. Uh, historically, Notts had a very good ex-players association that was set up round about the turn of um, the millennium. Uh, I think David Needham and Don Masson and Les Brad were heavily involved in that. And that, that was a very good initiative that the ex-players ran themselves. This, I think, is more of a club initiative to bring the former players into the fold. As we said earlier, Stowe, you know, you can talk a lot about football clubs, but ultimately, you know, it's about players and fans because they're, you know, what else do you have other than memories? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's right. And I think Rotherham are the team that, that have started this off, like a guy called John Brecken, who I, I know quite well from, from years ago. Um, and it is, you know, it's, it's, again, it's engagement, isn't it? It's engagement with, fans and players it's crossing that that divide okay ex players in this case but but i think things like that things like that nowadays are are, are great you know it's good pr for the club why not have get if you can get a group of ex players that, that can get together you know throw it open to the wider community again football clubs are community assets it's not just you know ring fenced as it's all about football it's a community asset we said this particularly heavily through COVID, didn't we? And, and what the club were doing mm. there. Um, and I think this is just an extension of things like that, ways of engaging people, bringing people into the club, bringing people together and harmonising and thinking, do you know what, Notts County, they stand for, for good. That is that is a good place to be around. It's got a good feel about it. And and all initiatives like this and others, I'm sure will be will be done and engaged with and hopefully it can be a success.
Yeah, and we are hoping um, the invitation has gone to Joe uh, to come on to the show, has been accepted. Uh, so we're currently kind of waiting to get a date sorted. And Joe, obviously, in addition to that, will be able to tell you about um, the new, uh, not new bill, but the new fan zone, uh, a kind of a Wembley box park type of thing uh, that the club have also uh, sought planning for planning permission for which is uh around the back of the pavis as i understand it so a lot of things going off um behind the pitch uh with joe there uh trevor greenfield and look we'll put this to bed now i was there at 1202 i have photos of the water on the pitch um do, 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 do. uh club are working to get a fairly quick rearranged date i'm told uh and anyone that has bought a ticket that can't make the rearranged date can get a refund so clearly you made the journey you unfortunately you can't get your travel refunded but if you can't get up again, clearly it will be a midweek game. You will be able to get your ticket refunded. Um, right. OK, it is um, uh, <laughs> Colin Scott, Kedwin's dad. Ah, I've seen shorter episodes of Gardner's Question Time. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Colin. Hey, very good. Um, right. OK, let's come to a meaty subject. All right. The, um, the three thirds rule as pioneered by uh, former Notts County player Alan Birchin, uh top, top guy, started out as a Notts County fan. Everything in life, he said, um, and I'll get to the point in a minute, in answer to Colin, I'll, I'll drone on a bit. Uh, three thirds. One, two, three. Two extreme thirds. So, Notts County, Stuart Maynard, where are we? So, there's one third who... Not worried if we lose every game between now and the end of the season. We'll do a rebuild in the summer. Stuart Maynard is the man to take us forward and we'll be fine next year. That's one third there. But the third at the other end, who've already decided that Stuart Maynard cannot make the step up from Wealdstone to Notts County, get rid out of his depth. There's a third there. And I would suspect the biggest third in the middle for want of a better phrase, kind of jury is out a bit too early to make decisions, but clearly has not gone as well as we might have hoped after Luke Williams left us, given that we were in the playoffs within striking distance of automatic. We're now in the bottom half. I think clearly automatic is a is a distant memory. And there's a there's a bit of a battle royale uh, on to make playoffs. And I am an optimist in that regard. So, um, Flock, tell us where you, which third you are in. Stell, you quite surprising is the wrong word, but you were quite strong in last week was a must win game. You know, players don't normally sort of put themselves out there um, looking at the overall picture. Where are you in in that well, grand scheme of things? Yeah, I mean, last week I said it was as close to a must-win game as you're yes. ever going to get. Yeah. You know, the only time you've got a must-win game is if you're two points adrift at the bottom yeah, of, of last course. game of the season. Yeah. But, yeah, just because, and, and you've probably seen it again, I don't see loads on social media, but you've probably seen the reaction of what I thought losing to the team bottom of the table, i.e. Sutton, would do for the feeling around the club, for the... You know, and and then it's fell out. There's a fallout with you know players, you know fans having a go at the players with a, with Dan Crowley with his celebration, which didn't didn't see at the time, but obviously has been brought up since. And then Aidan Baldwin kicking a, a ball into the crowd, and yeah. Carl Cameron speaking to players, and and all of a sudden all that negativity comes up, which we haven't seen for a while. You know, yeah. we have not seen that for a while. Um, but that's that's why I thought that game was was as close to a must win as you're possibly going to get because what you don't want is we've been on you know we spoke about the momentum of, of the success of building on it you know you don't want things starting falling apart and then all of a sudden you know you've got something that tips people over the edge into into like you say you want to talk about thirds getting that extreme yeah. reaction you don't want that extreme reaction negative reaction becoming bigger than it absolutely needs to be so the truth is where am i i'm, I'm firmly in the middle Yep. in the middle of, of them thirds, if you want to talk about it, in that, you know, everybody can see we are in a slump. 
a, a big slump. Um, you know, with relation to, to Stuart Maynard, particularly, I'm not even a chance to say hello to him. I've not even a chance to welcome him to the club yet uh, because, like I say, because my bit's on the radio, I don't get a chance to get pitch side too often. Um, so I've not even a chance to speak to him. He's had seven games, won one, drawn one, lost five. So the understatement of the year is not started how he would want to be. Um, but for me, and the reason I'm not totally up the other end of the scale is, I don't think you can ever just write anything off and go, well, if we lose every game between now and the end of the season, don't worry about it. He'll be in charge next season. He'll be given the summer and, you know, next season. I think you've always, in football, you've all, you're have always, what's the word? You're always auditioning. You know, you mm. are always auditioning. And, and you know, God forbid, we lose the next 12 games. Then, let's be honest, I don't think, Anybody would say that that one win out of nineteen means you get to stay the you know you know get to stay the summer. Any football manager would know that, but the highly unlikely chance that that is mm. going to happen, I think you know, absolutely fine. Like seven games is not long enough to judge anybody, no. particularly when results were how they were before he came in. So so look, I've got I've got plenty more time for him. I think he's got to be given more time. He's got to be allowed to to try and turn this around because it's difficult. We talk about momentum all the time in sport, all the time. It is difficult to, to, t- to turn things around. It's a massive challenge for him. You know, it's a bigger challenge. And I think maybe he realised when he, when he took the job, obviously he's going to take the job. Of course he is. It's a mm. great opportunity and he will back himself and will still back himself to be able to turn it around. But I think given the quality of the players that he's working with or, be, or been working with, then I think he would back himself to have, to have done better. But again, I go back to let's have a look at what the players are producing. You know, it's not just down to one man. There's never one simple answer to why things are going well. And there's never one sim- single answer to why it's going badly. And now when it's going badly, you go, everybody's got to take collective responsibility for it. Um, it's no one person's fault. It's a collective. It's, it's a togetherness. That's the meaning of a team. Everybody's in it together. And for me as an ex-player, it's probably easier for me to look at the players and go, are all the players, can all the players go home and say, do you know what? I'm playing A at the top of my ability. Not many can say that, but that happens. That can happen. We've spoken about form coming and going. That happens. Are they giving everything? You know, again, I wouldn't necessarily question that particularly but then it's that collective: Are we doing enough as a team? And that's the bit where I think they've got to they've got to come together. They've got to, you know, really galvanise themselves because the knives are out. And what I, what I don't want to see, and what really is concerning, is when, you know, when the the flak starts flying. I know we said something different then, but when the flak starts flying, you've got players having a go at their own fans. You know. Fans are going to have a go at you when you're losing games. That's their right. They pay the money. They can come and do what they want. You can't have a go back. You cannot have a go back. You know, it's it's as much as you want to. They've backed you. you, you nobody ever downplays any credit when you get it. And we've had and the players have had plenty of that in the last eighteen months. What you know, this first sort of sign of any sort of um, animosity and any. Anything less than less than satisfactory, you know, booing or shouting. To it's got to the pro, the professional makeup of you. It's got to be water off a duck's back as a player, and you've got to go. Do you know what? Deep down, and and Dan Crowley, I'm sure, if he's given right right of reply, and Aidan Baldwin, and anybody who was involved in whatever it might have been, or however minor it might have been, I'm sure we would first go, yeah not the brightest thing to do. I apologise. You know, the fans love the players, but it's the frustration that gets them going. And and the players love the fans and need the fans. You know, it's a two-way relationship. And But just in the heat of battle, in the heat of emotions, you can do things that you regret. regret. Um, but it's not good to see because it only flames the animosity. And you'll get bigger factors or factions turn on certain players because of it. 
the only the only way you can write that is okay nowadays you've got social media potentially but uh, i wouldn't particularly advocate that the only way you can write it is by going on the pitch going across the white line and putting in a shift and giving everything you've got for the shirt and performing and you know what if you lose the next game you take the booze and you take the take the criticism and you go right i'm going to roll my sleeves i'm going to give even more in the next game and you do your damnedest to turn it around a lot to think and talk and discuss about there, and we'll come on to that specific thing you uh, point you mentioned about players. Are they, should they, allowed an inverted commas a right of reply? I'll give you my thoughts on that in a minute, which might surprise you a little bit. Uh, but but lots of comments in terms of the th of the three thirds rule. You know, get rid, keep whatever, take a considered view um dave woolley if results don't improve there won't be anyone in the fan zone chris jordan i'm in the middle third but we need a win as soon as possible to boost morale john gregory safe and rebuild for me uh ian cooksey i'm in the maynard in the third category uh ian haywood luke williams knew very well what was happening with the tough games that were coming up and got out while he could Ian G, middle third, but if results don't improve by Easter, then taxi. Uh, got to give him a chance, says Kenneth Pointer. The step is too, the step up is too great for him, says Mark Leach. Middle third, says Graham Oates, but need to start winning. Paul Huskisson, still a chance for the playoffs. I'm in the middle group, says Ian Haywood. Uh, Ian Cooksey, first bad run for five years and the internet toys are out of the pram. Uh, Maynard stays, give him time, says Malcolm Shearston. Uh, echoed by Dave Woolley, give Stuart time. The defence still needs sorting. I'm in the middle as well, says Jürgen. Uh, David Amy, we will make the playoffs with a bit of luck. <laughs> yeah, but a few results won't go amiss as well. Ian Cooksey, well said, Malcolm. Uh, Gaza Lee, I'm in the final third. Crowley, Baldwin and Cameron aren't even uh, my, in my next season plans with their attitude. Only positive is looking forward to Bajrami, Scott and Palmer returning. Jordan says, I was at Prenton Park on New Year's Day and it quite easily could have been 6 or 7-2 to Tranmere. The idea that Stuart Maynard is the problem is total delusion. Uh, Lippy Jane, Bradford City think they're in a great position to get into the playoffs and they are behind us. The difference is when they have the run of the ball and us. Ian Cooksey, Sam Allardyce won one in 20, relegated, then look what happened. Everyone should be refreshed for Saturday, says Royston, looking on the bright side. Um, Nigel Cameron, we're on the brink of losing everything that was achieved under Luke Williams. We cannot afford to get this appointment wrong. Um, I remember last season, says Royston, three games in and Twitter was in a meltdown saying Williams out. Um, Ian Cooksey goes on, some of these players are not good enough. They must have been told three or four times, but they are still making the same mistakes. Martin Blaney, it's concerning with the poor results that the crowd will reduce dramatically as we have been getting over 10k at home games. Uh, Lippy Jane, Harrogate away for me was the worst game. And my goodness, there was beef on the pitch between players. Turn their backs on the goalie. Uh, that was all under Luke Williams. Callum, I actually think the fans have been very patient with the team. Last week was a build-up of frustration uh, of us throwing games away uh, and being our own worst enemy. Uh, Ian G, how far would the brothers let the crowd drop before taking action? Uh, Joe Crabtree, Paul himself predicted we'd have a run of four consecutive defeats this season. I think I said five, Joe. I remember this. And I'm, Stow was a little bit unconvinced. Yeah. Uh, but I, it's just football ups and downs, you know. Uh, it happens to most teams. Well, well remembered, Joe. Uh, it's just how you react. It's harder for knots because they're so used to success. Middle third, Paul says Wool Jam. Uh, Stuart Maynard definitely needs time. Uh, he's hardly had 
any uh, in reality. But he also needs to stop giving those cliched answers in the press conferences if he wants fans to believe in him. Derek Flowers, can we trust the transfer policy to get the right players in come the summer? Margaret Grant, give him 10 games. AD Clark, evening AD, uh, SM needs a chance. But this will be his first test of working under immense pressure. Uh, Joe Crabtree, I agree, Jane. Uh, Harrogate away seemed like a turning point. Very unpleasant on the pitch and on the terraces. Um, OK, good, good thoughts, good comments. Um, right, Dan Crowley, here's my view. Um, fans um, up and down the country pay their money uh, and quite rightly can say what they think. I, I, I draw the line a little bit at internet with someone that's never been to a game and says, I've been, I, I know your commentary is a brilliant style, but I've been listening to Mark Stallard and Cameron's rubbish. He never heads the ball. They, they ain't seen a ready game, you know. But I think if you pay your money, right, and decide to have a dig, that is absolutely your prerogative. Martin Allen, when he talks about fans going to a football game, forgetting the trials, the tribulations, the stresses, the strains, taking your normal brain out and doing whatever you do at a football match. Um, but I also think players have an absolute right to dig back. Because if you're, I'm not saying it's a great idea, but I, I absolutely think they have the right, if they wish, to dig out fans. Um, and, you know, would you rather have a Dan Crowley, for instance, that didn't, up his ears and all of that sort of thing and not score two goals end of the day dan crowley uh, i think clearly you would say jim o'brien was one of a very very small number of players that you could say come out with and i hesitate to use the word credit but did better than most but end of the day dan crowley scored two goals in midfield from midfield in that game right so he ain't done terrible from a hardest job in the business is to score two goals um so I, I would actually in a perverse way stick up for dan crowley if he wants to sort of make his views known to the cop so what we're, we're adults um i'm not saying that doesn't you know you can then argue well, that doesn't do much for you know fan etc relationship dan crowley scores in the 94th minute on saturday right i hope we i hope we get a winner before then um and goes to the cop they won't boo him. They won't boo him. Yeah, it's fantastic, damn brilliant. So I would kind of reserve the right of players to have a dig back. I think, to be fair, I probably, I believe Kyle. I know Kyle a bit, and he was sort of saying he wasn't, um, he wasn't arguing with a fan. He was kind of saying, look, look, try and stay together. And my view at the time of Aidan Baldwin was he was trying to smash the ball into the advertising board and said he's just gone above the advertising board and ricocheted into the crowd which then becomes interpreted is he's tried to smack the ball at a fan or something like that so i don't think those two were an issue and i i, I would I'd, I'd reserve the right of dan crowley and any player to give a bit back no yeah i think i'm gonna have to disagree with you a bit no, that's right. hey, hey, absolutely. Well, but, but this is but but again this is this is i would disagree with what he said but i'd agree with part of it like you say the fans can obviously pay the check. The the what the mitigating circumstances for Dan Crowley. Let, you know, let's be on his side before we hang him out to dry completely, yeah. which is not what we're going to do. No, well, is, I'm not. You might. He, but I'm not. No, well, no, I'm not. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not going to hang him I'm, out I'm, to dry. Yeah, but I'm no. going to say no. He, he shouldn't have done it. He's in the wrong. Yeah. You know, bottom line, he's in the wrong. Um, but mitigating circumstances. He's in the middle of a game. Knots are up against it. He's just got his second goal and equaliser. Uh, and he knows not to run a poor run. He'll be frustrated with the situation, with everything that's going on. And he's made... I've done some stupid... Not many, but I've done some stupid <laughs> celebrations after scoring a goal. Believe me, the feeling of scoring a goal is as good as they advertise it, right? So you you, you lose your mind for a little bit. Yeah. You know, however yeah. that is. And the mitigating it is he's lost it and he's done some like I said, I didn't even see it during the game on commentary. We were doing whatever we're doing. I, I didn't catch the uh, the celebration. Um but I'm sure he would probably say now that oh god, in the cold light of day, I shouldn't have done it. 
it was just a reaction, a split second reaction. It was just as if to say, look, we know you're booing us. We know we've been crap, but please stick with us, right? That would be what the, you know, sit down and think about what your response would be, what he was doing. But it, it manifested itself in cupping his ears to the cop because they'd been giving some stick and whatever. Yeah. Right. But the other side of the coin is part of your professional makeup is that when results are going badly and you're not beating the bottom team at home after you've been sat top of the table three months previous, mm. the fans are entitled to give you some stick. And believe me, just as I've had daft moments after scoring goals, I've had plenty of moments where I've been called all things under the sun. Mm. Thankfully, not too much by my own fans, but but <laughs> by anybody. You know, and, and you know that the feeling within a, a ground is, is not a good one because results are going badly. It's manifesting emotions. Now, again, the problem I have with it is that it's not so quickly repaired that three seconds he would have cupped his ears for to the fans mm -hmm. the damage that's done in some people's eyes more than others but the damage that does to his is sort of how people view him is not repaired in three seconds you, you're right if he scores a 94th minute winner next week i'm sure everybody will forget everything they've said and mm. gone do you know what absolutely no problem which is which is right and i hope that is the case but I just think it sets a break. Imagine you had everybody in the team. It's all right for one to do it, two to do it, three to do it. You're going to have a pretty toxic atmosphere mm. if things don't turn around. And that's going to build and snowball. And that will, all of a sudden, people won't pay their money and come and watch. And, you know, no matter what they see, hold on a minute, we're going to go pay our 25 quid or 20 quid or whatever. And we're going to get the fans, sorry, the players giving a stick back for not cheering and not, shouting and applauding the right things no sod that for, for a game of soldiers will not bother and that you know that, that yeah, that's magnifying it a massive amount but that's why it's not clever you know it's not clever mm -hmm. and i'm sure dan crowley given a right of reply would would apologize and say yeah not the brightest thing i've ever done you know again just focus on scoring goals it was just frustration heat of the moment thing again but He's not killed anybody. He's not, you know, done anything severe that's irreparable. But I do think it was, you know, it was a head loss moment a little bit. A little bit of a head loss moment. But it's in the heat of battle. They're the mitigated circumstances. I hope and I'm sure fans will forgive him. But they will be judge and jury and they'll go, right, you go out there and show us with how you play that you're worth us forgiving you. And it's as simple as that. And we come back to players, just go over the line and perform. Let your performances speak for you. You're only as good as your last performance or your next performance. You can say, do, and that's why I'm not a fan of, of social media and players being on social media. Mm -hmm. I, I get about engagement and, and all that sort of thing, but it's an emotional game. There's a lot of passion involved and, and things can get blown out of all proportion. And certainly in the modern day and age, you, you can get a, a, you know, absolute, you know, what they call it cancelling now cancel culture and all that sort of thing yeah for for, yeah. for what you know that the actual what's happened will be lost you know it'll be blown up out of all proportion and it'll be magnified and and made into something it isn't it was like i say it was a daft thing to do on his behalf i'm sure he'd apologize for doing it and it's a it's a result of frustration at the team's performances yes he'd scored a couple of goals but by scoring a couple of goals doesn't doesn't exonerate you from having the same standards and, and having to pull, you know, with everybody. We're all, all on the same page. But again, it's frustration. It's the fans' frustration and booing. If the team was playing well, they wouldn't be booing. It's it's a chicken and egg situation. So, look, the only way it gets solved is by improving results, improving performances. Uh, Jordan Andy said, it hurts me when our fans start getting on the players' backs even though I can kind of understand it. I would much rather all of us just got behind them, even if we bang that drum uh, till we all go deaf. Um, Joe Crabtree had seemed really out of character for Crowley. Uh, always comes across like a sensible lad who's enjoying his time at the club. At least it shows some shared frustration.
frustration. Uh, Jordan adds, we should be supporting not giving out heavy doses of slandering. Um, Callum says, I think the Dan Crowley situation was a bit of immaturity on his part. But bottom line, he's a Rolls Royce footballer and will get 100 percent and he will get and he will give 100 percent next week game uh yeah uh, and i think ian cooksey would probably take a more critical view uh of the conduct uh or his interpretation of the conduct of the player right still so um hard the i think you i think you caveated last week um the uh defeat um at the hands of Sutton as as close as possible to a must win game uh, you know the question that's coming now um where, where, how do you characterize assess saturday at home to wimbledon pretty much exactly the same you know it, it, the the loss at sutton and then they all they I say it, if you want to use a phrase then they're all going to be must win games between now <laughs> and the end of the season but i think i think more the term the must win for me, is to turn this cycle. Like yeah. I said, we talk about momentum. Eight last eighteen months, it's been an upward cycle all the way, and look where we are. Okay, where we are now, but where we've been for the majority of the season, averaging above ten thousand in the state in the stadium for home games, which has never been heard of in recent times. You know, positivity around the place, win percentages like you wouldn't believe, home home record that is is you know fantastic um obviously up until about four games ago you know everything was positive and you felt right we're going to keep going we keep going we're attracting fans which is good for the business side of things which means the club can do more spend more bring in better players etc etc and then it turns and you only want it to turn again forms up and down it's the roller coaster of a season that we always say about but but you don't want that downward momentum where people start, you know, you have the spats between players and fans all of a sudden. We haven't had any of that for 18 months particularly, have we? Unless, I think there's one episode, wasn't there, somebody being personal with Jim O'Brien on social media mm. 18 months ago, whenever it was ago, which is out of order, but it's the modern world. But mm -hmm. in general, you need to win to just bring a bit of the good feeling back. You don't want, as you've just read out there, a couple of people starting to think, oh, do you know what, if this carries on, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother turning up to that. And all of a sudden, you're back down to six and 7,000 at Meadow Lane. And that then harms the business side of the club, harms the finances, harms the chances of doing well on the pitch. And again, it snowballs. So everything is hand-in-glove situation. So when I talk about must-win, it's, it's more than just must-win for our chances of, of the playoffs. It's, it's nearly a must-win because you just want to stop this... Uh, sort of eradication of, of 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 the goodwill towards the players, and you don't want a wedge driven between the players and the fans because again, it's been a fantastic ride for the last eighteen months, particularly that I'm sure everybody's enjoyed. But now it's just gone off the boil a little bit. Now we've got to sort of try and turn the heat up again and get better, get everybody enthused. And and you know what better than a win on Saturday to go? And again, I go back to Saturday with Bradford. We, we had this. Going back a million years to when I was at Bradford and the unmentionable final, player final. But I think at this stage of the season, I think at Bradford, we were somewhere similar in the table and we had to, or we did win something like nine out of the last 12 league games to make a run to get the last playoff spot. And history, when I say we won the playoffs, got promoted. A win Saturday could be the catalyst of that for Knots. People say it's not going to happen. Look how we're playing. Look at the defence. Look at the goals we're conceding. But it can happen. Not saying it's going to happen, but it can happen. And what better way to turn things around and give everybody a little bit of excitement coming towards what, you know, we've been winning, winning non-stop for the first three months of this season and then it slid away. Well, what about getting us all back on board? The excitement we'd have if we were, you know, three or four points outside the playoffs with five games to go, but we're on a winning run. We've won games. Everybody would be back on board and pulling in the same direction. But it all has to start with something. And what better place than a win this Saturday? Um, as I think it's been enunciated by Martin Blaney, uh, it'd be really nice to win a home game um, as we have shipped 10 goals in the last three home games. And, 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 and I guess, you know, 
whoever you are, if Liverpool lost three home games and shipped 10 goals, their fans would be on the back of Klopp, even though he's leaving at the end of the season after a, you know, a, mercu- a, a mercurial reign. That kind of level of defeat at home on the bounce is going to upset ev- any and every single fan base in the country, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Of course it is. You know, football fans are dictated to by the performances and the results on the pitch. All of us are. You know, that's the whole the whole reason for being being a, being a fan, isn't it? Yes, you want good football, and and you know, predominantly we get that. Uh, for knots, you know that that's a that's a bonus. But like we've spoken about before, it's result first, performance second. You know, mm. it's always the way in elite sport. Perform- uh, sorry, result first, performance second. Now, again, that's not me saying, oh, let's go back to just whacking it long and blah. You know, it, it's not me saying that at all. W- Luke Williams has shown us that you can play football and win games. Pep Guardiola, Jurgen Klopp have shown you can play good football and win games. You just need the players to be good enough, to be um, coached well enough, to have the mentality to be winners. You know, and it can be done. But, you know, you're absolutely right. Result is paramount. And anybody who's, who's sort of lost three home games on the spin after the home record that Knotts have had for the last few years, you know, that's not even just when we've been successful. Even under sort of Ian Birchner, we were we were pretty good at home. The home record was good. Um, you know, losing three on the spin and not having one in four, that would, would set any any fan base into a little bit of worry. So, again... Another reason why we need to get back to winning ways as soon as possible. Interesting uh, debating point. Um, you and I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly of a more of a vintage than you are, because you, you've aged far better. But um, the, it is an interesting debate between performance and result. You would come from an era result. Yeah, I would come from an era with result. And some of the people that I worked alongside in football were hugely driven by result, no matter how you got it. But certainly with the younger coaches, uh, some of our younger fan base, they, and I've heard them say this, they will say performance first, result second. And I notice, and he may not mean it this way, but but with Stuart, when he talks, he you know, uh, ahead of Wimbledon, after Wimbledon, we need a performance. He didn't say we needed a win. He said we needed a performance. Just on an individual level, I don't actually agree with it. But it is an interesting debate now. Performance seems to hold a much higher category of importance than it kind of ever used to. I mean, what do our flock think? Performance? Result? I mean, what's your take on it, Stel? Well, I'll tell you, result before performance. But what I would, again, I'll try and I'll try and play devil's advocate. Yeah, and, exactly. And exactly. Sort of allude to what they might be doing. I think what and Luke Williams spoke about it as well as Stuart Maynard, and I think that the modern breed of coaches go through, and they all go through the same sort of coaching badges and and sort of mm-hmm. learn the same things, and then bring their own personality and and things to it. I think what happens now is, and certainly with the possession based football, is that. If you get a performance with the way that you play, with the passing of the ball and moving it around, if you get a performance, it gets you into positions on the pitch that give you more chance of the result following. You know, so so they will argue that, as like the old days, sometimes ball goes along up to a big man, 50-50, can he win the header? Somebody might get on the flick on, you might get a goal from it, you might get a second ball, you might do this, you might do that. They will argue that today's precision passing if done right. well, i.e. with a good performance, it's more precise, there's less room for error, and you are more likely to get into then attacking thirds, into the opposition's box, and potentially give yourself better chance of winning the game, i.e. getting a result. You're not relying on if my centre forward wins a flick on, if my other striker gets the ball, if the ball breaks for us in the box. It's more precise, it's more scientific, it's more data-driven than it ever used to be. So that's what they will be working on, something to that effect. But I don't, when they say they want a performance, they definitely still want a result. There will not be a coach, a manager anywhere, an owner, a, you know, head of any anybody involved with knots will not be satisfied that we play brilliantly on Saturday and lose 3-1. 
or three two or seven six or whatever whatever they will not be satisfied with that it is performance but if we get performance with the way we play and the players there's the belief that that brings brings a result not all the time because free things can happen but if you get a performance 46 games out of a season then the chances are you win the vast majority of them that's the way the modern coach and, and data driven person thinks right playing devil's advocate on you mr star yeah, yeah. i would never ever disagree with you right that's not me that's just me being devil's advocate i know yeah. and i'm i'm giving yeah. it back to you and, and i'll read all the comments because this is a very i actually do think this is a very interesting debate to have and i do think it is quite age driven as you've mentioned in terms of younger coaches older coaches yeah younger fans older fans um we obsess i say we the club obsessed over statistics in the National League, principally with passing metrics, possession metrics. Most people would say we've been in decline two months. Some would even say three months. I doubt any of our statistically based supporters could find, it might not even be one, more than one game in which we have not dominated possession and we have not doubled or trebled the number of passes completed to the opposition. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Yeah, and absolutely that, agree. That, but that is where I, you know, as an amateur, as a fan, that's where I struggle with this mantra because and I, we're not having that much less possession or that many less completed passes in the last two months than we were in the national league when we already lost a bloody game all season yeah and, and again there's a number of reasons and there'll be a number of stats that they have i know the passing and all that sort of stuff are the ones yeah. that get publicized more you know all that does for me is emphasize that the passing hasn't been good enough I say stats can tell you whatever they want to tell you. It's how you interpret whatever stats you are given, and what are the important stats? Why? Why have we been poor in the last? Or the results have been poor, and we have been poorer in the last three months than we were the first three months of the season. You know what? What's happened? Like I said, we're still dominating possession, but we're not doing as much with the ball. We're not playing the important passes, or or like I say, as more. The metrics that are probably more relevant is that the defensive metrics yeah. about how pressing many the ball, aerial winning headers the ball do back. we win in the box? How many you and I both bang on about this? How many first balls do we win coming into our box? Absolutely, and and they will have the stats of this. Again, they may choose what <laughs> is publicised and what isn't. You know, again, and some of the stats, the, the more in depth you go with the stats, yeah. you know, they're they're harder to dig dig out not you know i know what to do stats and i know um there's there's other online stuff that, that what is it why scout that do stats yeah. and, and things like that and again you know even that if even if you break down stats you know things that are binary are easy to say a pass being in possession from one player to the next you're in possession that's it you know a goal being going out that that is a goal there's so many stats that are still relevant to to the person interpreting what they're seeing Mm. You know, so so again, you've still got to factor in a, and I'm sure they do. They factor in a sort of margin of error or a difference of opinion, sort of thing of, you know, things like that. But but again, you're right. There are things that are basics in football, elementary bits, first contact, winning your headers in both boxes, things like that, that are more relevant to the outcome of a game. Yeah. Than have we yeah. got three percent more passing than the opposition? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So so look. Again, stats stats will tell you so much. Stats stats will tell you so much, but they go hand in hand with what watching the game, seeing the game, seeing the players, seeing what are the important bits. You know, say so it's the age old thing of of you know a defender could win ninety eight percent of his headers, but if they're all on the halfway line and the two percent that he loses are inside the six yard box, you know it's going to affect the score in a negative way, isn't it? So, again, you, you you use the stats for the best, and, and it's great to have all these stats, but again, the best use of stats is cherry-picking and seeing what is there. Now, again, you can cherry-pick 
to mm. tell whatever story and back up whatever evidence you, you think your eyes have given you. But nowadays, everything's so stat related and stat driven that you've got to be careful not to use the stats to, you know, to, to back up your argument, if you like. It's, um, you know, confirmation bias, if you like, isn't it? That that I think such and such has happened. Right. Let me find some stats that back up what I think has happened rather than going, let's look at the stats and see what's actually happened. You can see with your own eye what, eyes what's happened on a pitch. The stats can just back that up or, or occasionally might go, oh, I didn't realise that, I didn't quite see it. It was a little bit different, but it's it's like you can never take stats in isolation. And I think those stats clearly have an integral role in Notts' recruitment metrics, you know, and um, we'll do our best to get him on. But I'd, I sound like Kevin Keegan. I would love it. I'd love it um, if we could get Richard Montague on the show. And without giving too many trade secrets away it would be interesting to understand a little bit more. And, you know, the first question I know that Richard will get is, well, you know, why don't we sign a six foot five centre half that can add the ball and doesn't have to be great technically, for instance. And there must be a reason for that, you know, in the way that the club's philosophy. But it would just be great to understand that kind of uh, methodology. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, I've said, I've, yeah. I've said, Paul. Sorry, and I've said, said to yourself, and I've said to, to Nick Richardson at the club as well. I would love, I would love to have a day. <laughs> I, I, me as an ex-player, you yeah. know, from from yesteryear to have a day behind the scenes to see how it all works. And I understand that again, it, we will want to be kept in house because you don't want to give your secrets away. You don't want to no. give, you know, anybody an advantage as to how it's done. But it, it would fascinate me endlessly to see, you know, the level of the detail that they've got and. And how that interprets in relation to individual players, how that interprets to opposition teams that you may be, may be scouting and, and looking at. You know, it fascinates me. I think that there's a couple of, um, there's a few Knots fans, aren't they, that do a lot of yeah. stat-based stuff as well. And, and, you know, it's really good and things like that. You know, that, that's great. You know, that, it's the modern world. It is what it, it, you know, it is what we are in nowadays. And it's no use being a dinosaur and going, oh, that didn't happen in my day. Mm -hmm. You've got to embrace it. You've got to go with it and say that that's what we've got now. But also say, OK, but you can't hang everything on just statistical observation because statistics, whether in whatever walk of life it in, is history. You know, I work in an industry where sort of past performance is no, no guarantee of future performance and anything like that. So, you know, that that is the way you can use it to influence you and model the future but it is no predictor of the future and again it's cherry picking them stats but i would find it fascinating absolutely intriguing and fascinating i would i would sign an nda if i could even go in and have a look at how it worked i would i, I, I honestly i would i would be i'm that much of a nerd i would be that interested to go and see it yeah, non-disclosure agreement for those of us wondering that uh, Stell dropping in the anachronisms there. Uh, right, let's read because it, because it's it sparked a lot of debate as I thought it might. Um, but we should say uh, I was going to say good evening, but it's got to be good morning to uh, CF one two three tuning in from hospital in Melbourne uh, and loving the podcast. If you are a patient, please get well soon. Uh, Gasly, uh, first and foremost, result please. Uh, we need to be street wise too. We are a soft touch. John Gregory, win then perf win then a performance. Ian G, result 100%. Nigel Cameron, three points every time. Ian Cooksey, results every time. Play poorly and win and nobody cares. Graham Oates, results as I am an older person. <laughs> Dave Woolley, results in League Two. Otherwise, we could be National League again. Again, uh, Stephen Newton wins, pay the bills in the long run. Uh, performances are a bonus. Um, Jordan asks, do we think we uh, fans and maybe even players still compare ourselves to Wrexham and uh, in our first season back in the EFL? Callum says it's no good playing nice football if you're bottom of the league. We're well, not bottom yet, uh, but if you can get a performance and have a greater overall chance of winning, I think most fans will be happy. Uh, Paul Willits, the worrying thing for me is the possession stat. How can a team only have 20 to 25% possession and beat you by two to three 
goals. Uh, Steve Carter, we perform at 76 to 80 percent possession at the moment, but we are not getting the results. Uh, result first, performances second. So every defeat against Knots is a result over performance. Um, Nigel Cameron, Mansfield, Wrexham and Stockport don't play pretty, but they win games. Uh, Jordan Ask uh, says, especially considering they were our own, they were only our rivals last season. Wrexham are having a bit of a dip themselves at the moment. Um, Ian Cooksey, taking Mansfield as an example, Clough was happier with a 1-0 win at Newport than a 9-2 win at home. AD Clark said, um, Stuart said, we need to start building from clean sheets. When was the last time having all the possession and a good performance resulted in one it's funny you know uh, you went, depending what, what ways in which people wish to manipulate recent results and decline uh versus success now it's got back-to-back -back clean sheet style uh i want to say morecambe was certainly one of them we scored something Don like doncaster and morecambe doncaster and morecambe at home mm. christmas new year yeah people forget those two people forget yeah. those two um Don stabs a performance and a minimum one point is a must. Um, du, du, du. Ian Cooksey, there's only one stat that matters. Uh, Chris Jordan, a big reason is Palmer's work shielding the defence and doing the simple things so well. We've missed him massively. That's uh, Mr. Palmer. As you've said, Stell, and I'm, and I'm not, you know, not saying Matt Palmer is not hugely in, uh, influential. Matt Palmer. Uh, is, is is now probably one of Notts County's all-time greatest ever midfield players on the basis he hadn't played for seven months. I, I was going to say, what the team have done is enable Matty Palmer's agent to go in and negotiate him a pay rise because he's suddenly become absolutely irreplaceable, hasn't he, in the, uh, the Notts team? Oh, yeah. um, Ian G, um, we would have still declined even with Palmer fit as we were sussed by October and one man wouldn't have prevented it. Uh, Paul Willits, the stats say other teams are a lot better than us uh, as they only have the ball for less than half an hour in the game, but still beat us. Lies, damn lies and statistics, says Stuart Newton. Um, Chris Jordan, 62.743% of football statistics are completely made up. A man after my own art, Chris. Exactly. A man after my own art. The old I mean, ones are the best. I, 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 I put it in the book, um, but it is a true story. And, you know, XG, you set me off on this stuff. That's another one I, I attach, I think, virtually zero importance to. So XG, which, which is shown on Match of the Day and all of those sorts of things, is the number of the quality of the chances that you have. And it's given a uh, a figure. And then you add the figures up of all the chances and then you come to an xg of four and the other team might have an xg of 0 0.3 but they actually scored one of the goals and the other team missed them all yeah so you know so you could have a team with an xg of 0 0.2 beating a team with a, 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 an xg of four but you said to me still didn't you um how do you compute xg and i was in america and I was talking with Taylor Twellman, who's a former American international, and also with Bradley Wright Phillips. Remember him from Plymouth? Yeah. Uh, he's gone yep. out to America. And we had the exact conversation. And, you know, and Taylor Twellman explained it to me. And I said, you're joking, aren't you? He goes, no, that's how they do it. And in Bradley Wright Phillips, it's rubbish. So if, I don't know, let's think, Macaulay Langstaff, right? Six yards out, right? Now, let's say, let's say 12 yards out, okay? Ball comes across, right? Um, you're 12 yards out, right? Ball comes across. I, 60. 16 stone, that's being generous. 12 yards out. The XG for all three of us is exactly the same. It, th there's no waiting in terms of how good you are as a striker, whether you are a midfielder, whether you're particularly left-footed or right-footed, whether you are a right-back for Notts County who has never scored in 350 appearances, the ball falls to you 12 yards out in the same position. 
your XG for that right back is the same as Macaulay Langstaff, who bangs in 40 goals a season. Now, some of those metrics are starting to move and they're trying to attach weighting. As it stands, it's a computer algorithm that works oh. out the number of times a player scores from that position. They all get fed into a computer, yeah? But it makes no allowance for the player. It makes no allowance if it's the 89th minute, nil-nil, and you're the away team striker or the home team striker. It's a computer algorithm that's at this moment in time of its evolution it's just you are prescribed a computer value. I didn't know that. Well, well, I didn't know, but I tell you what, that's a great takeaway for us all, isn't it, tonight? We're all as good as Macaulay Langstaff from 12 yards out. There's a positive spin to end the night on. <laughs> hey, we're, we're as good as Lionel Messi in the MLS. It's all the same. <laughs> oh, dear. There's one to be dro dropped out in the pub after a pint or two, isn't it? Tell you, mate. Yeah, by the way. <laughs> I've got the same XG in front of goal as Macaulay Langston. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just as good at Messi from 12 yards out. Yeah. Oh dear. But no, it's a lot. People know my views on stats. You are, you are as always, Stel, the voice of reason. Uh, and clearly, you must embrace them. But it's only part of a pot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of a pot, you know. And no one can really do it yet. But how do you measure resilience? How do you data metric a player's character? You would know and I know every single human being is different. Some players, Martin O'Neill would say to me, I won't say the player, one of the best players in Europe. And he said, when the sun was out, it was 72 degrees. There was no wind. He was the best player in the world. Right. If it was only 68 degrees and there was a drop of rain, it'd be useless. Right. And clearly it's an exaggeration. But the, the point being, there are certain players, they react differently in different situations. And you have to understand, I think, those characters and, and, and what goes into assembling a team. And I still maintain we, we will judge Stuart, not necessarily by by rotations, formations, overloads, transitions, all the other buzz techno babble. We'll judge him by his ability to man manage this group of players yeah so like every manager will will eventually be, be judged on results and we hope he's judged in a favorable light because he's had success you know so you know yeah. look like i say the data is like you say it's not the solution because it's we're not sport sport any sport not an exact science so it can't be broken down completely and i'm sure all the people that are in the data analysis game will not say look we're not trying to decode the game to solve it there is no solution but we're here to try and help we're here to offer a different side an analysis side that maybe those with a you know an analog view of the game a footballing view of the game haven't seen before but it goes hand in hand you know there's never one side trumps all and if you've got both sides of it why not have a 360 degree view of, of everything but again like everything You've got to cherry pick what you need. Everybody's got a view on the game. You know, 10,000 fans in Meadow Lane have all got a view on the game. Doesn't mean that every one of them's right. You know, so uh, you've got to know what to listen to, what to take on board, and particularly Stuart Maynard and the coaches and the players. They're the ones that actually matter and, and the recruitment people and all that. They're the ones that actually matter. And they have to sift through thousands of people's opinion, unqualified opinions from people like me and everyone else and they've got to sift through loads and loads of data opinion which is statistically correct but by people who've not played the game and you've got to amalgamate the two as best you possibly can to give you an advantage or try and gain some sort of advantage whether that's on player recruitment of picking up a a, a, a bargain if you like or somebody that's gone under the radar or whether that's analysing a team that you're playing against, finding a weakness, something that they do time and time again, or a fault that they've got, or something they're good at to watch out for, or whatever it is. But like I say, it goes hand in glove. They are two sides of the same coin. They're not opposites that are fighting against each other to take control of the game. If they're using the, using the right way, then then 
it just it, it's more strings to your boat. Uh, here's a good, I had to read this a couple of times, a uh, message from Paul Willits. It's quite good. Uh, Paul, having a high possession stat is no good if you don't do anything with the ball to give Maka a chance of having a high XG. Yeah, I, th I think I understand that. I think that's right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Chris Jordan adds, I, I hope Stell gets the chance to go into the club uh, and see the stats work. I tell you what, it'd be a good feature, you know, you or maybe you know, more you than Charlie, but, you know, do like a BBC East Midlands piece, you know, going inside, yeah, yeah. inside oh, the I'll tell you, I I'd it's love the, it. It's den, you know? Yeah, I, I'd love it. I would love it. I, but there's one thing, Paul, I always say, there's a mate of mine says the same, says that I've got some stats for you. He says, I'm in possession of the trousers in my relationship 99% of the time. He says, it's the 1% where all the decisions get made where I don't have it. He says, <laughs> the possession can tell you what it wants to tell you. <laughs> uh, very good. Right. We've got on a bit tonight, but it's been, it's been a good chat. Um, I, but I just want to finish on this because we... Um, I think a lot of pressure's been put on him, to be fair. He's been hyped up. Um, striker, you've seen him come off the bench a couple of times now. How close do you think Jatta is to starting a game? Or do you... And clearly, this would depend, you know, how long David McGoldrick's going to be out. Um, but, he, you know, the manager did put Jatta up front, Langstaff on the left side for the closing minutes uh, last week. Um how far is Jatter off starting for you? Well, not far, I would imagine. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, I think the club paid six figures for him. You know, they, they sort of said that. They, they paid six figures to bring him in. Um, I get, yeah, I know it was the, the winter break over there, so he might not have been quite up to speed. But you don't pay that sort of money to, to sit on the bench, for a player to, to come and sit on the bench. Of course, you've got to earn your way into the team. Um, but I... I, I I, I imagine it's not far away as long as he's showing up in training and doing well in training, doing the right things. If the manager believes in him or Stuart Maynard, the head coach believes in him, um, then I'm sure he, he will start him if he thinks it's best for the team. Um, can he score goals? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Um, look, I've, I've seen him for less than 90 minutes. So he looks like he's got a physical presence. He looks like he's mobile. He looks like he's got a willingness to work and, and prove himself. And hopefully he can he can get used to how we play and, and be a be an integral part of it. So I, I certainly don't see why. Like again, you've got to back the recruitment that they've they've brought in somebody who will score goals for us. Uh, Paul Willis, Jatter and Macca, the new Keegan and Toshak partnership. <laughs> 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 that that would be interesting. Hey, we, we we obsess over three at the back, four at the back. I mean, do you foresee? I can hardly remember it happening as playing two up top or not. Yeah, well, I can. Yeah, because particularly when results are going against you, as Stuart Maynard's discovered, and what he's been proactive in doing is not just keep on doing what you've been doing. You know, he's he's looked to change it within games and from game to game. So I don't think I don't think playing two up top, if you're talking about Jatter and Macca with somebody in behind or or some configuration in behind, I don't think that's that's out of the uh, realms of possibility. But again, he, he watches them every day in training. He sees them day in, day out. He'll see whether, you know, they look like they could play together. He see what he thinks best best for the team. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't say it's maybe too far away at all. Interesting, interesting. Well, we've we've covered a lot of ground tonight. To say we 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 had no minutes of football to discuss on Saturday. Um, let's hope. Um, well, I'm sure we'll get ninety in on on Saturday. I, I would counsel uh, Stell, me included, um, keep an eye on the weather forecast because Crawley. You took you spoke about bad pitches. Crawley's up there, you know. Crawley is up there, and they had a game right. off, didn't they, not long ago? It might even been this weekend. Um, their pitch historically has been very, very poor too. So I would, you know, I, anyone planning to travel and all the rest of it to Crawley on Tuesday, I would, um, yeah, keep keep an eye on things. You don't want a second journey, to, a, a wasted journey in in the space of ten days. No, we certainly don't want to waste a journey down to Crawley on a Tuesday night. No, that's for sure. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, thank you, everyone. It's been really good tonight. Good chat. Um, let's get down the lane on uh, Saturday, uh, the visit of Wimbledon. Uh, Stel, thank you very much, as always, for all Pleasure. your excellent insight and comments. Um, we'll be back next week. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and catch up with you all soon. Take care. Cheers.